So quite a few years back, a guy named Kevin Leroy, also known as Sir Hyen, or Sir Hayen, made some amazing fan art effects for League of Legends. This led to him eventually getting a job to come work with us on the League of Legends team, and I had the pleasure of getting to know him, really cool guy, and some amazing effects that he did. I reached out to him recently again and said, hey, you did these awesome effects back in the day. Would it be all right if we took them at VFX Apprentice and brushed them up a bit, updated the source files, and then released breakdown videos to explain to people some of the insights and techniques that were used to make these awesome effects, or really to make any stylized handcrafted effects for a MOBA. He was super excited and supportive of it, gave us his blessing, and that's where this series is coming from. We have multiple videos that are going to be coming out. We're going to see how many we do based on the interest, so go ahead and leave a comment to let us know. And we're also going to update the source assets as well. So as we do a new breakdown, we're also going to release the source files that Kevin used in the latest version of a game engine so that you can go and get a hold of those over in our free training on our website at vfxapprentice.com. Okay, so enough for me for now. Let's dive into the breakdowns from these awesome effects that Kevin did. Welcome everybody. I'm Sandra Femenia, lead technical artist here at VFX Apprentice, and today I'll guide you through the first breakdown of League of FX, a League of Legends fan art project from Kevin Leroy, also known as Sir Hyen. The VFX that we are going to break down today is Arcanist Jinx Super Mega Death Rocket. This is her ultimate ability a projectile with an area of effect impact that can travel in a straight line through the whole map. It can be used to snipe low health enemies or steal neutral objectives even at the other side of the map. A really powerful ability and a great starting point for this series. We are going to divide this ability into four different bits. A build-up, which happens at the start and signals everyone that Jinx's ultimate ability is going to be used. The cast, which happens right before the projectile appears and signals that Super Mega Death Rocket is coming. The projectile, which urges the enemies to try to dodge the rocket to avoid the area of effect damage. And finally, the impact, which happens if the rocket manages to hit an enemy. Without further ado, Let's get started. First, let's take a look at this bit in isolation. As you can see, it works closely with Jinx's animation while she takes Fist Bones, her long range weapon, and gets ready to shoot. Here, we can see that the bit has a lot of different moving parts. On the right, it's playing at half a speed, but even then, it can feel a bit overwhelming. Don't worry, because we are going to break down these BFX down to the smallest component. And speaking about the smallest component, here we can see the first of many fuzzball textures, as we like to call them, being used as part of the initial energy gathering before the Super Mega Death Rocket makes its appearance. But this emitter on its own isn't enough to convey the idea of huge amounts of arcane magic being concentrated inside Fist Bond. And here is where our next emitter takes over. Maybe it surprises you to know that these are actually two different emitters using the same texture shown here on the right. The first one pops in and out three times without any rotation and with a smaller scale every time, while the second pops in twice and half a slight rotation to the left and the right for each of the bursts. This is a clear example of the principle of not trying to do too much with only one emitter, and showcases how a great use of timing and the strong textures can carry the essence of the beat without having to rely on super complex technical knowledge. Color-wise, all three are pretty similar, and this is something that we are going to be able to appreciate during all the bits. This helps them all feel connected and powered by the same kind of energy. After those, we can find this emitter working with the texture zone on the right. This kind of texture is usually used to mimic a light effect called bokeh. 
We can also find this other emitter using another bokeh dot texture with a much bigger gradient and a smaller core due to the tiny size of the particles. Both of these emitters help with the satisfaction of using this ability since both of them linger for a bit after the rocket is launched. We need to be careful with this kind of lingering emitters because we don't want to clutter the space and compromise the competitive integrity of the game. We can then find a slightly smaller fuzzball texture being used for both of these emitters. And once again, we can appreciate how using different emitters is usually the best move when it comes to representing an idea. In this case, these particles coming out of fist bones have both the core burst of concentrated, high speed and high drag particles and the more spread out particles. As a random fact, you could see this same behavior in real life when metal is being cut, for example. So keep your eyes always open looking for inspirations like this that you could add to your VFX. Coming back to our main subject, here we can see on our next emitter the first use of a flipbook. As Halsey explained earlier, a flipbook is a sequence of images that when played one after the other, creates the frame by frame animation. In this case, it starts with the top left image, followed by the top right image, the bottom left image, and finally, the bottom right image. And for our next emitter, we can see the use of a sprite seed. This is different from the flipbook in the sense that instead of moving from one frame to the next one, the particle will appear with one of the different choices, giving variety and dynamism every time we use the ability without making any major changes that could confuse the player. Another cool thing about this emitter is that it has a tileable noise texture being multiplied on, on top of the room. Due to this noise texture being moved, it gives this room this magical feeling. Here you can see the comparison of a non-tileable texture and a tileable texture scrolling. The non-tileable texture has this line between rotations that breaks the illusion of infinite scrolling. You can check the Sunfire Cape VFX breakdown that Jason did if you would like to know more about this technique. And finally, here's our last emitter of this bit. This emitter is making use of a really cool trick that you can do with a cylinder mesh and this kind of swirl texture that you can see on the right. Usually, for this kind of emitters, you would have to model a complex solar coaster to get those cool looking swirls. But by applying this texture on the cylinder UVs, you can get the same result in less than half of the time by rotating, translating, and scaling the cylinder mesh instead of modeling a fully custom mesh. On the right, you can see the final result. I've enabled the shadows so you can appreciate the cylinder the texture is wrapping around. And that's all for this initial bit. I hope you are able to now look at all these emitters without feeling overwhelmed. A lot of concepts will be reused throughout the rest of the breakdown, so you'll get to see similar examples of the same techniques to better understand them. With our build-up now covered, let's move on to the cast. Let's take a look at this bit initialization. This bit is also playing according to Jinx's animation. Right when Fizzbones, her long-range weapon, is ready to shoot, this bit takes over to further signal that Super Mega Death Rocket is on its way. Just like with our previous bit, the cast might seem a bit overwhelming, with a ton of different moving parts, but let me tell you that this bit uses almost the exact same emitters as the build-up, with tweaks to the meter values. And this is the power of reusability in a nutshell, and why it's important to keep a clean library of emitters ready to be kitbassed into new VFX. Starting with the initial glow, we have our already covered emitter repurposed to signal that the ability is already cast instead of the ability is going to be cast soon. Same textures, same three emitters, similar colors, different scales and timings, but a common goal of giving visual feedback to the player about what is going to happen next. Following along, we have our satisfaction emitters, those that linger a bit after the beat is completed, without cluttering the field. And once again, same behavior as the build-up, but with slight tweaks on speed, 
scale a number of particles because charging energy and releasing it is not the same. With our fuzzball particles, we can see the first of the big changes between the buildup and the cast. Before, the particles would spawn at a constant rate, meaning that particles would be spawning until the emitter dies. But in this case, we have a burst of 20 particles that are emitted all at once, because as you know, charging energy and releasing it is not the same. There's no secondary spread out particles like before. We can convey the behavior with just once since all the other emitters will be covering up the spread of the bits. For a flipbook emitter, we can appreciate a change in scale, directionality and amount of particles being spawned. But the behavior is the same. One frame goes after the other. For a sprite seed emitter, the biggest change is that now we are spawning a burst of four particles at the same time instead of just one. But the technique of multiplying a tile noise on top of it is also being used here. And finally, for a cylinder mass emitter, the big change is also having our particles being spawned in a burst instead of a constant rate. And that makes two out of four bits covered. Hopefully you are now able to see both the similarities and the differences between these two bits. Time to now move on to the projectile. With a couple of exceptions, we are going to see same or, or similar textures and techniques being used, so we'll spend more time on those that are new to avoid repetition. For this bit, we'll make use of a different camera angle. This will allow us to better see the trail of the bullet. And speaking about the bullet, this is made of a bullet-like mass wrapped with the noise texture multiplied by another noise texture that scrolls over time, just like the runes we discussed previously. Surrounding this bullet, we have this cap capsule-like mesh wrapped around by a mask texture. This is multiplied by one of the noises used on the bullet with the difference that this time it's really stretched and scrolls at a higher speed on one of its axes. The mask texture will define where the noise texture is going to be seen. 100% visible where it's white, transparent where it's black. This helps the bullet feel like it's going at super high speed. Right at the end of the bullet, we find this fastball texture being used to merge the trail and the projectile. And this same texture is being used in all our four next emitters. First, we have two different glows that fake the emission of light from the bullet, one being larger than the other. And then we have these light and dark trails that are similar to the sparks emitters we covered before. The difference is that they are being spawned with a constant rate of a time of around 35 particles in world space. This means that even if they are spawned from the bullets and the bullet keeps moving, the speed calculations and such are done taking into account their position in the world instead of the position of the bullets. This will be a common trend moving forward, so keep an eye open for that. Just like in previous bits, this texture is being used for the energy trail that lingers behind the bullet even after it explodes. Then, we have these two trails making use of the same flipbook texture multiplied by a scrolling noise texture that we've seen before in other emitters. The big difference between them is that one of them is being spawned with a random rotation, which means that each particle will be pointing to a different way. After those, we have our runes sprite seed trail. As we said earlier, each particle will pick up a different rune from the sprite seed that will get multiplied by a tileable scrolling noise. After our runes, we have our swirl texture being wrapped around cylinders. The main difference between them lies in the initial opacity and the color over lifetime. This means how opaque are the particles when they spawn and how the color will change until they disappear. And finally, our fake smoke trail. This one is using a different texture that we haven't seen yet, and it's being multiplied by a tileable noise texture that moves really slow to avoid too much chaos. And those are all the emitters used to create this beat. Now, let's take a look at the impact. The impact 
is by far one of the most important bits when it comes to satisfaction of ability usage. When creating this kind of area of effect abilities, always keep in mind how is the player going to know if they got hit or not. This is done nicely in this case with the big circular decal on the ground. If you are inside the circle, you will get damage. If not, you won't. A cool trick that game designers use from time to time is altering the size of the hitbox around this circle. If they want to reward the player that launched this ability, they will make the hitbox slightly bigger. This means that if the character model is near enough of the circle, it will get hit even if visually it wasn't inside the circle. This can also be done the other way around, shrinking the hitbox so it's a bit smaller than the area of effect indicator. This will make enemies feel like they have dodged, even if they should have been technically hit. So always be in touch with your team. There are tons of important decisions like this that someone else took and that you should visually convey. With that being said, let's now break down this last bit. By this point, I'm sure some of you might be able to differentiate some of the emitters being used, but there's a lot of new things to cover on this one. So let's briefly show our already known type of emitters and then cover the new ones. Starting with our glow, we saw this one being used during the build up and the cast, but this time it lies on the ground, right where Super Mega Death Rocket hits the enemy. Then we've got our directional and radial sparks. We saw these kind of particles in all the previous bits, to be honest. And once again, a great showcase of how much you can do by reusing your textures and setting up different values for your emitters. We can also appreciate two different kinds of lingering modes in this case, both of them being spawned with a burst, but with significant changes in scale and amount of particles. Then we have our Burst Runs Emitter, once again making use of the multiplication by a tileable scrolling noise. And finally, for the emitters that are similar to the ones we saw before, we have our Cylinder Mass Reels. These two work closely with each other to bring dynamism without taking the protagonist seat. And their main difference is the color of our life. All the other things are the same. Now on to the new stuff. First, we have this particle that makes use of Death Faith, also known as Soft Particle. As you can see, wherever it collides with the ground, it fades out and becomes invisible. This particle is always facing the camera, so even if League of Legends wasn't a locked camera game, the emitter would still look good. We can avoid having to create a sphere mess and get away with a single card or plane. Next, we have these ground shockwave emitters. Nothing fancy, just particles spawning in the ground, changing color and size. But what makes these emitters are the textures. Once again, great examples of how strong textures can carry you and how important it is to keep your emitters doing just one thing at a time. After those, we have our scorch emitter. This darker emitter is being used to ground the beat and to compensate all the other flashy emitters. This is also something common to see after an explosion, so remember to always keep your eyes open for real life inspirations. And finally, our area of effect indicator emitter. This one is making use of a circular runet texture being multiplied by a pining noise texture that drives the opacity of the emitter. And that's all for these last bits. I really hope you gain some inspiration to go ahead and start creating your own fan art for your favorite games or even custom VFX for your own projects. Even if it feels overwhelming at first, take a little step at a time and by the end you'll reach your goals. Remember that you don't have to always reinvent the wheel and that it's okay to reuse assets and emitters that you've done in the past to create new things. In the description of this video, you'll find a playlist with all the fan arts VFX that Kevin did before joining Riot Games. Feel free to let us know down in the comments below which one of them would you like us to break down for you next. Thanks for your time and see you soon.